before we get to the main events, we've got a few more details to address regarding last time. And that relates to the Getter team and what's happened in the last 15 years. As I detailed in part 1, well, Getter Robo Armageddon was setting things pretty much to hell. That nuke did go off in this version, sending out Getter Rays over everything, but for some reason it was suppressed. Getter Radiation levels continuing to fall fast, and Hayato and Benkei really don't know why. Even though the resurgence invaders they all fought against lost them their other comrade, Musashi. Yeah, the main Getter team exists in a Larry, Mo, Curly, and Shemp state, with Benkei being the Shemp that always replaced Musashi. Like, some people complain about a character always dying, but in Getter stuff, Musashi literally always dies. There's some kind of rule to it. As for Dr. Saotome, they have no idea what happened to him or the Shin Dragon. They presume both were destroyed. Still, more analysis on Vilkas' dimension jumps does confirm they're safe to allow everyone transit, so it's almost time for the choice in the route splits, and whether the crew can make it home. But first, we've got some fun on our hands, in the name of some DLC and a bonus mission. First off, there is a mission I didn't mention before from right after the group got sent to the UC dimension, a disquieting clash. Periodically, Nine uses all the combat data she's recorded, and sets us a training scenario that sends the crew up against a mashup of all the antagonists they faced up to this point. Basically a hard mode of their past encounters that gets worse as time goes on. Everyone that gets roped into them think of them as a pain, but that is part of the joke. This one though is the easiest of them, and they do go up from here. Next is acting the part, where we get some friction between the current and former commanding officers of the Nahal Argama. Now, I like Captain Otto from Unicorn, a lot, he's one of the most level-headed and fair captains of the Universal Century, so I side with him against the jackassery of Beecha Oleg from Double Zeta. Then again, Beach is one of the characters that I hated in Double Zeta Gundam due to the selfish crap he would pull, so that series giving him responsibility over... arguably the best designed ship in the Universal Century over that of Bright Noah who got put on a bus from looking over the assembled Double Zeta brats? Yeah, that was a mistake. And this stage is part of addressing how Beach is an irresponsible shithead, and never changed from that despite calling himself the leader of his little troop. When Judao has the better claim to that title with how, between him and Rue, they're the responsible ones. And if you're not going to be responsible for others, then why the hell are you trying to lead? His antics cause Otto to have some sort of attack, putting him out of commission just as Neo Zeon sends an assault force after them led by Sleeve's member, Angelo. Angelo directs them in turn into obvious traps that Beecha keeps walking the crew straight into, completely incompetent against anyone with an actual sense of tactics in their head. It's only because Angelo's comrades forget that the Nahal Argama has a hypermedica particle cannon on its bow, and destroys the one generating the trap, do they get free and turn the tide. But the stage treats it as some big combat tactic that makes Beecha a genius, when it's really just the enemy forgetting what this ship can actually do, as it uses that gun so rarely. But at least it ends with Otto punishing Beecha for basically hijacking the ship for his own ends. The second DLC mission that occurs here, A Grudge Among Men, has a bunch of the guys actually after girls or have girlfriends be extremely jealous of Othrin and his near-universal sex appeal to the fairer sex, especially the continuing infatuation Chris and Rosalie have for him. Well, him and Bonjo, who is likewise a girl magnet. But at least he keeps the girls drawn to him to members of his actual supporting cast. Beecha and Shin join in on the ribbing of the losers, envious of the lost chance at attention from their many respected women of the crew, up until L and Luna want assistance for their own things when their respected boyfriends are watching. I feel Shin thinking Luna was flirting with Othrin to be a bit odd since, well... Her sister Mayrin spent most of Destiny crushing on Othrin, which only hurt attempts for Othrin to reconcile with Kigali, and hurt the siblings' relationship as well. Plus, honestly, what do they have in common beyond an actor allusion to all of them playing card games? Yeah, seriously, Othrin is voiced in Japanese by Kira Ishida, who voices Oster Phoenix in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Mayrin is voiced by Fumiko Orikasa, who voices Rika Nanaka, and Lunamari is voiced by Maya Sakamoto, who is also Shizuka in Duel Masters Cross. So yeah, the stage is all about those who don't have the looks or skills to appeal to girls, taking out their frustrations on being dateless at those who could get a date if they want, 
but are saving themselves for their actual significant others. Honestly, if Kigali was here in the Akatsuki, she would be so mad at either Othrin or the Arsenal girls, and I don't know which would be funnier. This is clearly meant as a comedy breather stage, and I find it hilarious that Nine and Kira are just here watching the train wreck happen on its own. All it's missing is them raiding the galley for some popcorn to watch the fireworks. What, Othrin's put Kira through enough crap that I could see him getting a laugh at his best friend's expense, especially after he broke his sister's heart. In reality, Nine and Kira get all the guys sent out on a scouting mission together to sort this stuff out, before it would actually affect anything major. With them coming across an amalgam unit, and these scorned guys charging on in... For the glory of the Empire! And basically, they're all idiots. Especially Kurtz Weber, that was one of the insiders of this event. I would use clips of Kurtz being a failed womanizer for Full, full Metal Panics anime, but I don't want to get his voice actor anywhere near my videos if I can help it. Unsurprisingly, this amalgam unit is under the leadership of Gates. Another, he's supposed to be dead, Full Metal Panic antagonist. That is an appropriate thematic reflection of what these dumbasses could become. Gates in Full Metal Panic's canon isn't just an immoral killer, but a womanizer and pedophilic rapist, having sexually assaulted two of Gauron's disciples with no care to their wants, only his needs. And since Sosuke is not here, well, Gates's unit has a working Lambda driver, so none of them are able to damage it, at least normally. Othran, however, is used to fighting units that tank all damage and takes his job as field commander seriously, as he should, he's got a few deaths under him, Nicole the most notable on that list. And since the Infinite Justice specializes in dominating close combat, well, the Lambda driver can only do so much when it's being bombarded from all directions and rammed with a flight pack. <laughs> From Othran leading them to surviving this ambush, the guys all have a newfound, or in Shin's case, rekindled, respect for Othran that mostly addresses their envy. After all, if the reason the girls are all over Othran is because he's fierce and dependable, well, that's something they can learn to emulate. At least if Nine didn't record the entire thing, so her and Kira could riff on it, allowing everyone to see what they did. This leads to the normal bonus mission that occurs here. Unlocked if Sosuke has a kill count of 40, and the Full Metal Panic team have a combined 100 between them. Thoughts patterns. As the Ship Alliance works on figuring out how to use the Vilkis' singulars to get them back to the AD dimension, causing Ange to do constant dimension jump tests to get them data, well, it's wearing Ange out between the teaching and advice of Ryoma, Amuro, and Setsuna for this, as they're all survivors of their own dimension jumps. Like, I get why Setsuna is doing that, the Quantum Jump Drive and the Quantau is meant to be an FTL system, but both Realm and Amuro got ported to other universes on accident. And furthermore, the Vilkis is pretty different tech than the others in this, so the disparity probably isn't helpful. Especially since Vilkis' mode changes are done in response to emotions and intent of its pilots as the Vilkis is sentient. So the closest that might work is Sosuke, since emotions and intent are also how the Lambda Drivers work. The Lambda Driver really doesn't work that great for Sosuke either, and he can't do that consistently due to his own damage. Regardless, they're all pushing Ange too hard, so she tries to skip out on training, which she didn't need to do, since Sosuke and Kaname decided to take a day and visit their old school, which had to close down after Amalgam attacked it. That event, if you've not seen it, is from the opening episodes of Invisible Victory, and actually is a culmination of a brick plot throughout Full Mortal Panic, of Sosuke trying to prep and fortify the school against attack and invasion, to the point that the other students have PTSD from all his antics. A serious accident has just occurred on the fourth floor of the North Building. It was, of course, caused by Sagara. <sighs> the thing about that incident is it basically broke Kaname and half the cast, her best friend Kyoko being severely injured in the crossfire, leading to her making some bad choices. It seems in this continuity that attack was thwarted, Sosuke evacuating Kaname, and likely putting them on the 12th of day non, right around the time it got ported to the AD dimension. Still, with them back and with some downtime, Sosuke's got enough of his head in the right space to want to do something for Kaname, and cheer her up since the Whispered stuff has been more on her mind as of late. Leading to the return of... Voice Changer Disengage. Roger. Voice Changer Disengaged. Oh. 
Why does this keep happening? Bontakun! Yeah, context. Sosuke stole an animatronic costume from an amusement park and modified it into a mini arm slave that he uses to protect Kaname covertly. He then sold the design of the suit as riot gear for police use. Yeah, Full Metal Panic for Mofu is a weird yet fun parody season. It actually gets better though, as Bontakun actually shows up in the series Amagi Brilliant Park later on. And he's not alone in the silly suit up. This other patchwork mascot, Ligeti, is from Cross Ainge. I refuse to deal with this. Lady Angelis! My name is Likalina! Licky Licky! I mean, how else would a former princess get around unnoticed? Unfortunately, the giant suit was intended as a secret joke gift for Ange in the first place. She and Vivian had initially bonded as friends when the younger girl gave a charm of one to her as a gift. So Ange stealing it as an escape disguise when it was intended to get her away for a day to relax? Talk about irony. Unfortunately, Amalgam has kept tabs on the school in case Sosuke and Kaname came back. Gate swooping in again to face them, and with the assembled group having no weapons on them. Or do they? As remember, it is impossible for Sosuke to turn off being a soldier. For today was the day the teddy bears had their picnic. What makes this all the more hilarious is the track that plays for Bontacoon is an intentional riff and parody of the A-Team theme. Anj and Vilkis also get in on this. Anj learning that due to unlocking Ariel mode, her bond with the paramail has strengthened to the point the mech can now summon itself to her side at a moment's notice, from across all of space and time a plot point that becomes relevant later. So the two members of this Fozzy gang double-team the pedophile rapist to defeat him with the power of furious anger. What can we say? It's... unbearable. Still, Kaname thanks Sosuke for doing his best to cheer her up, but all she really needs is for him to stay with her. Forever. And hey, good one on Kurtz. He called in their friends to see them before they had to ship off again. To settle things to the event, everything goes nuts in the future. As for the Bontacoon suit? Oh, when Sosuke is not using it, Salia keeps it as an accessory for acting out her Magical Girl cosplay. So, route split. Obviously half the crew is going back to the AD dimension, with the other half staying in the UC. And the split is as you'd expect. The AD natives returning home, while the NCC groupies are sticking to see if they can't sort out the UC timeline's issues. I mean... They can't, but they're going to make an attempt. And this is where things hit the fan for the Invisible Victory adaptation. And I again have to repeat that it's sloppy from how Invisible Victory did it, since the event triggers for it have all flagged either in backstory or prior stages, with the introduction of Tessa's estranged twin brother, Leonard Testarossa. Leonard, unsurprisingly, has a strange obsession with Kaname, as she's managed to dive deeper into the Whispered Effect than any of the others and it is starting to negatively affect her. Her having an episode in the Danan about how everyone's work to protect others is meaningless, which causes Sosuke to get her off the ship to try and get her head on straight, as she's starting to believe that the Whispered are the cause of all the malice in their world. The NCC Dimension had their events happen that it turned out okay. Uh, were you paying attention? The Earth Federation pissed off an alien invader so badly it's committing genocide. It's more like all problems are caused by uncaring elites and idiots. I'm going to spoil this now, as it's from Full Metal Panic content that has not been adapted into anime form yet. Kaname is slowly being taken over by an entity known as Sophia. Sophia was a girl forced by her abusive father to be part of a Soviet-Russian project experimenting with brainwave connections. And when the experiment blew up, it killed her and released two types of energy waves. The first created the Whispered from people who were born close to the time of the incident as their brains were affected by it. The second unstuck Sophia's consciousness 
from the normal boundaries of space-time, existing at all points simultaneously. In this way, she can psychically whisper information she sees across space-time to those that can hear her thanks to the first energy wave, and thus permit advanced technology not invented yet to be invented earlier than it could have been, and altering the timeline in doing so, thus being the origin of Full Metal Panic's black box technology. This is also the purported explanation for that bit from earlier about the UC tech being more advanced than it was in the NCC timeline, despite the tech and event similarities that I said don't contextually work and no, they're actually at the appropriate points for that technology. And also why Kaname is starting to blame the Whispered for how bad things are in the UC timeline, despite them not being the cause of it all at this all, well the Gundam stuff at the very least, happened in the NCC timeline without the Whispered around. Kaname's growing self-loathing and bitchiness is contextually a result of her connection to Sophia growing stronger as... Sophia hates herself. She's seen that wars never end in her world, and her efforts through giving the Whispered future tech to create peace never seems to work. Sophia feels she's made things worse, and Kaname can sense that and is convincing herself to put the blame on the Whispered. But that, again, is because of uncaring elites and idiots continuing and instigating a cycle of war, especially in the Universal Century timeline, where Tomino has made it canon that it doesn't. A few people can't stop that. It requires more people than that to turn away from such an unsightly end. And that takes education on the costs of one's actions. None of that is made clear here. And as a result, without context to this, it makes Kaname out in these sequences to be a know-it-all bitch, proposing a stupidly simple solution provided by her genius intellect, aka information fed to her from Sophia, but one that is willfully blind and ignorant to the true causes of conflict in the world, because Sophia isn't actually omniscient and omnipresent, despite how she was scattered across time. She can see snippets. She can focus her attention on one bit of time at a time, but not the whole truth as it's still limited by what she sees into a twisted perspective. And sadly, some of the Whispered have been infested by that perspective. And thus centers the most twisted of them, Leonard, the creator of Amalgam, who wants to use his creators of war, who have escalated wars, to end all war. And yes, that is a hypocritical statement. Unlike celestial beings who've lived tragedies caused by conflicts so want to intervene to stop unnecessary ones so people can talk out their problems, Leonard wants the technological power to subjugate all man so they can force the world to be made anew. And Sophia, through Kaname, can give him that. And thus he offers her the deal with the devil. Join him! And with their combined power, they can end this destructive conflict. Just as she's been influenced to want, in Invisible Victory, this worked better because her friends were getting injured in the crossfire as part of the conflict over her. And Kaname is influenced to surrender to him, as Sosuke is forced into battle with Leonard's men, and even Leonard's own Belial arm slave that wrecks the Arbalest, leaving Sosuke at his mercy. And with no other options... Stop it right now! <gasps> Uh, Chittery, don't do this! Chittery! The lady made her choice. You lose, Sagara. Despite all his efforts, Sosuke has now lost the woman he loves. And worse, the one that took her was once an ally. Kalanin, Tessa's immediate second command, and Sosuke's father figure. There's more to the stage than that, too. When the fight breaks out, the Gamalas end up showing up as well allied with Amalgam, Melda included, though it's against her will. Fight Melda with Akira in the Zero Fighter, though, which unlocks a later stage, as you're able to shoot her down and bring her in to help her. Sosuke is in bad shape, but will recover given enough time, but with Kaname kidnapped, they've got bigger things to worry about, such as Embryo approaching Leonard in hopes of an alliance. Oh, but Leonard isn't the only mad scientist on the prowl over here. Dr. Hell has his own plans. And as such, as the Yamato crew are trying to get anything they can help them out of Melda, who only really knows the Gamelon fleet is cooperating with Neo Zeon in exchange for supplies and a chance to use the Yamato to get back home, 
Hell has its subordinate Blocken attack the ship Alliance as they try to make their way to resupply at the Mossiker's home base of the Photonic Power Research Institute. And they've brought new... or rather, old enemies. Hell has found the remnant cells of the invaders and fused them with the shelves of the mechanical beasts to create a new type of drone, but one that is extremely dangerous to control as it could slip their leash at any moment and start evolving like mad due to all the spare Getter radiation that is still in the atmosphere. What? That's what happened in Getter Robo Armageddon. However, this is also where the dragons come in again, and as a result, a tying thread starts to appear. The Getter radiation that the Earth should be contaminated with was suppressed and taken out of it. And likewise, here are some dragons that can trigger gravity fields, and by doing so, drain the power straight out of the Shin Getter Robo that is powered by Getter Rays and their radiation. I like this. This is very smart. See, in the Cross On series, dragons literally eat radiation absorbing it into themselves and crystallizing it into a resource known as Draganium to purify the land poisoned by it in a past calamity caused by someone blowing up reactors that absorb cosmic rays, so life can thrive in it again without that radiation poisoning being a problem. Getter rays, as established, are a type of background cosmic radiation that can incite rapid evolution and mutation. Thus, logically, if the dragons eat radiation, they can suppress Getter Rays by draining them away. No rewrite of the skills here necessary. Spoilers for Cross Age. The Founding Nations are the ones opening the singulars that bring the dragons to their world, using the Norman to slaughter those they abduct as Draganium as the source of mana, and thus is harvesting it from their corpses. The dragons aren't the invaders, they're victims defending themselves. So yeah, we've got to kill the dragons interfering to stop both Brocken and the potential reinsurgence of the invaders. This gets the Shin Getter's power back up to full, and actually beyond that, as Getter power doesn't just come from Cosmic Rays or the Shin's reactor, but those touched by Getter power as well. Thus, as Brocken tries to flee when his plan fails, Ryoma, Hayato, and Benkei unlock the Shin Getter's ultimate attack. <laughs> But as Brocken retreats, Ryoma realizes that when they drew out the power of Shin, he heard Go's voice in his head, the man watching in the distance, as Tetsuya comes to him, asking for his help. The crews make it to the Photonic Power Research Institute, the Mazaker cast asking Sayaka's dad, one of the researchers there, if they know anything about Tetsuya and the Great Mazaker, which they don't. And they likewise don't know how the hell the Mazaker Z got its new upgrades. That wasn't secret equipment installed into it in the event of an emergency. Hell, it didn't even have the capability for that equipment when it was last here. It's like this Mazager grew it on its own. Plot point. Those familiar with the Mazager franchise, you may have an idea of what's coming. Ryoma's putting the younger pilots through the ringer to bring them up to speed with the others, Shinji wondering if this is going too far. His own anxiety kicking in at how they seem to be fighting the entire world... And honestly, he just needs a reminder that they do have people supporting them. An element that is seen more in play as the next angel, Ramiel, arrives in Tokyo 3's airspace, as does G Hound. Oh joy, the Earth Federation's attack dogs are going after a collateral target because they don't like being upstaged and humiliated. And to think, the army of Earth isn't supposed to attack Nerve until after Tabris becomes red paint staining Ava One's hand. And yes, they're really beating into the ground how bad the feds are in this game. Which I really enjoy, as everyone from the Eva Command team cast gets a shot at a Reason Yasek line against them. As in order to actually deal with the Angel threat, we have to take out the G-Hound oppressors, including Lane. Make sure to shoot down Lane first and foremost here though, you get recruitment and tack points for them if you take them out before Romulo arrives in the battlefield. As when the giant D8 shows up, it erases their units from the battlefield, and it gets further enforced by a platoon of Neo-Zeon forces, 
who want to see it succeed. Why, though? Again, Neo Zeon's thing is not death to all Earthers, no matter how stupid Tomino tries to make his focus antagonist. It's freedom from Earth's tyranny. All of humanity dying because of another impact event actually does affect them, too. Hell, since Zeon is more resource-starved, it makes less sense to intervene here in the middle of the infighting, as then you're losing units on top of the chance that the fighting sides will forget their differences and focus on taking you out first. This makes no sense! And sure enough, while Lane's boss isn't interested in teaming up, well, this version of Lane has more of their priorities straight and is willing to help us out. Ramiel, however, is an event boss, so while you can damage the guy and use special shields to avoid its insta-kill positron cannon blast, if you get its health to zero, it'll just regenerate as its design makes it so that its core that you have to destroy is too deep inside to reach. At least in its original incarnation it was. In the Rebuild movies, they made Ramiel stupid in order to apply Rule of Cool to it, and making its crystal body amorphous. Changing shapes as it attacked with the positron beam, so its mass cleared itself from the range of fire, and depending on its own super strong AT field to defend it against everything that might counterattack. It made it so them then sniping it, not only obvious, but far easier as they could just distract it in the moment they counterattack, and it would then expose its own weakness. Original series Romuel? Yeah, the tension was a lot better, as they had to smash the damn thing and just hope they got the core. Either way around it, the creation of the plan and its complications was smart. Both Romuel and the Avis Positron Cannons, because they're firing magnetically charged energy shots, when they're fired at the same time, they deflect each other. So it's then a race of who can recharge and fire again first. The Ava's winning through because Ray defends the typing Shinji with an anti-beam shield and protects him long enough to update the firing calculation to account for Ramiel's own beam fire. So there's also a ticking clock variable to whether Shinji can stop the shot before Ray dies as well. The rebuild version of the scene people defend on the grounds of, at least it answered a question the series didn't answer, why didn't they just distract Ram with weapons fire from Tokyo 3's static defenses? And technically they did, when they fought Zerul later in the show, where those weapons were shown to be worthless. And in this game, they do make other reasons why they have to resort to the Avis Positron Rifle, specifically calling out the Wave Motion Gun as way too powerful for this. The Wave Motion Gun is not a sniping tool. It's for when you want to annihilate every possible thing in visible sight of the bow of the ship. Use it here, and the entirety of Tokyo 3 would be a melted crater as collateral. And their other energy weapons? Everyone else is having the problem of it scattering the fire, or it doesn't penetrate well enough to be able to do it in one shot, or otherwise does not have access to it right now. The ones who could do that are all over in the AD dimension. Worse, the replacement 7th Angel... I miss Israfel. Israfel was a fun story arc for Ava. Has also shown up early, with it being directly pursued by Ava Unit 2 and its chosen pilot, Asuka Langley Soryu. And no, I don't dignify the rebuild name. Once more, as this is in part based off the rebuild movies to expedite Ava's plot, we do not get a good introduction to Asuka here. The game rushing her intro, much like Rebuild did. So you only get a real read of her character if you've watched the original Evangelion series. It's basically Cliff Note's characterization Asuka, which, as I addressed before, Cliff Note's characterization Asuka strips out the nuances of the character that makes her likable and mediates her prideful ego and soon soon tendencies. I would say she gets better, but the Ava cast only have a few spotlight stages. And again, because it's the Rebuild movie's plot, it suffers the same issue of how they collectively did her dirty, by including her, but not having her really do anything but be an antisocial bitch. At the very least, she backtreads and reconsiders her starter comments upon seeing how Shinji's... well, better than his canon self, thanks to interacting with good role models. Hell, the game better explains her starter animosity and ego informed by the original series, as opposed to the movies, as here it frames her believed superiority to be a result of her being chosen from a list of candidates and training to earn her skill. Whereas from all available information, Shinji and Rei were chosen as pilots from nepotism based from their connections to Gendo as his kids, thus are less worthy the merit. After all, she doesn't know that Rei's a clone designed specifically to pilot an Ava, or that Shinji's unit is his mom's coffin and is very picky about its pilots because she can sense him, or that she herself was chosen to pilot 
because her own mother tried the same experiment on herself that caused Shinji's mom to be absorbed into the Eva that also caused her mom's soul to reside in it, but left the body as a deranged husk that then fucked up Asuka as it thought a doll was her. Again, everyone in the cast has some pretty bad trauma that staggered their development. It's, again, what pisses me off about the Rebuild movies, and that they seem to ignore that everyone has that, and seems to just shove it all on Shinji as being the problem, while they refuse to deal with their own issues, despite it being years later once 3.0 kicks in. Stagnancy on that level when there are bigger priorities than that, which such misconduct screws over, just doesn't happen. It should have gotten them all killed long before when the time skip picks up. I think that's why they ended up making the Asuka scene in 3.0 and 4.0 retroactively a clone, as the problem that 3.0 caused was just so insurmountable that that was the only way they had out of it. But yeah, Yazan and Jared actually help out in bringing the finished Positron rifle with them, and the Yamato repursing the power he'd normally send to the Wave Motion Gun to power the rifle. As to Pierce Ramiel's AT field when it's in active offense mode, it would normally require all the power in Japan. So while Tetsuya comes in to help and the Neo-Zeon forces are guilted into standing down from their nonsensical assault, Asuka takes out this strange pendulum thing with the assistance of a... spatial accelerator crossbow? I don't get it either, just roll with it. And Shinji gets his own chance, to borrow the phrase from Lacan Stratos, to snipe the stratosphere. <laughs> And no, I don't understand why a crystal structure explodes into a bloody gore in the Rebuild movies. Afterwards, Asuka introduces herself, with the Hathaway trying to attach himself to her in order to help round out Asuka's edges since, well, she reminds him of Quest. Please, Quest was a spoiled brat who held no value for anything. Asuka's ego issues are based on her actually putting effort in to gain what she does, but hating herself because she never feels like it's enough. Their only commonality is both pining after older men who don't return their perfections. Hell, in their ace pilot cutaway, that's brought up where interactions with the cast and helping as part of a team has actually made her feel better about herself, though this scene is supposed to occur later in the game. In that the pressure to be the best has been taken away, as they value her just by her contributing, and that helps her character a lot. But yeah, Asuka's gonna take some time to ease into everything, but we don't have the time to wait, as Londo Bells just received word that Neo Zeon is preparing to attack the seat of the Federation's government, the city of Dakar. All while the heads of the Vist family have gotten Marita into their clutches and are brainwashing her, trying to revert her back into the slave doll Plat 12 in order for her to pilot for them the Unicorn's sister unit. Our little alliance decides, unfortunately, that the best thing they could do to clear up the fugitive illegal orders mess with G-Hound is for them to come in and help save the Federation's leaders. Something several of the cast have mixed feelings about, specifically Hathaway, tying into his future of being the one that attempts to assassinate said leaders to free everyone from their tyranny, which Amuro says is a bad thing because it would make him like Shar. The Universal Century is literally the only bad end timeline in the Gundam franchise because the same elitist jackass has always remained in power, and used their forces under their command abusively to remain in power. And it's like, Amuro does not in any way elaborate on that. That is his entire defense. Whereas, stopping the people who are the root of the problem should end the problem. And I get Hathaway's following anger at Amuro actively ignoring the problem. After all, that's been Amuro's damn glaring character flaw since the end of the original Gundam. In Zeta, it was revealed he stayed at home ignoring the problem until the Titans literally came to his door. Char's counterattack? Ignore the problem of why Char would do this now instead of at any other time. Makes no substantive argument against the fact that the Feds fucked up and abused everyone in space, which is the only sane way to rationalize those events. For Amuro, he defaults to the moral black and white of the Federation are good because Zeon is bad because I'm part of the Federation and I can't be the bad guy. 
ignoring once again that the Titans weren't just a subset of the Feds abusing their power, but a group empowered to enact the will of the Federation government. It's like, I know Amuro doesn't have future knowledge to know how much worse the Federation gets with this, but he has more than enough information from his own history with everything to know he's talking out of his ass. Hathaway, likewise involved in these conflicts and from a family that is deeply aware of the reality of the Federation's crimes, that's why Lana Bell has autonomy, after all, to police the bad actors that expose and aggravate such rebellions from their authoritarianism, is more aware of the simple solution to the problem. Remove the leadership that is inside in this conflict, and it ends. It didn't end with Zeon, despite Shark killing the zombies, because they weren't the source of it. They were a symptom of the problem. Ergo, why Shar moved his campaign onto the Federation. Shar actually listened and observed the causes of the conflict throughout his life, while Amro keeps holding himself up in isolation, where he doesn't get perspective on the issue and its cause. And that's also what Hathaway and Boninger have gone off to do, get actual appropriate perspective. This ties into one of my favorite parts of the Unicorn series, where Boninger briefly is taken in by a neo Zeon unit after he's captured by them, and gets to see how they're really just people who have gone through hard times and suffered under the Federation's tyrannical rule. They just want the freedom they've been denied, nothing more. It's also where Boninger bonded with three different people, Marita, who is lost at this point in the story, Zinnerman, the captain of the neo Zeon ship Garencius that treated him well and looked after his well-being, while also explaining why and how the Federation screwed up everything. It made life too difficult for people. And to escape that insane world, they went out into space. There they created a different system. It was natural that one would arise, which gave hope to the space noids. A society is supposed to serve the people, not the other way around. That was what Zeon was all about, but the old system that was still on Earth rejected it. One tries to make the other submit. The government will never treat everyone equally, because systems born of two different philosophies can never be compatible. In a world where 10 billion people were living in space must have sounded like fantasy. So isn't it still possible that humanity could succeed? The hatred of the beaten and downtrodden runs so deep, it still clings to the Earth to this very day. And also another woman named Lonnie, who lost her entire family when the Federation in the aftermath of the One Year War went out of their way to slaughter any Xeon sympathizer they could find in the Earth's sphere, ultimately committing mass genocide to numerous colonies and exterminating entire countries on the Earth to do it. It fucked her up and led to her enlisting in the neo Xeon forces despite her young age because she had nothing and no one left. They were all killed because the Federation didn't want their citizens thinking things they didn't want them to. This was actually changed from the novels, from Lonnie's family being alive, but, you know, psychopathically murderous, with her father being the main one Bonnetro interacts with, and Lonnie just being dragged along. Both due to time, and, well, one person to interact with makes the characterization appear stronger as you have more time to spend with them. And their respective interactions are echoed at a faster pace here. Hathaway and Boninger following Lonnie out of town where she meets with Zinnerman, only instead of killing them to keep things secret, both spare their respective lives as they are not there to attack civilians, only military targets. As when you're at war with someone, one of the ways to defeat an enemy is to eliminate their leaders. It is in fact the fastest way to do so. It is swift, efficient, and results in the most minimal loss of life. As long as there is one primary source of antagonist, which, in the UC timeline, there is supposed to be. Oh, but what about civilians of the city not part of this? Well, sorry, the feds had advanced warning of the attack, and they did nothing to evacuate any of them. Moreover, the car, due to hosting the government heads, is a legitimate military target. Multiple cities that hold military bases throughout history have had the displeasure of learning that they are often the first cities attacked in war, as that's where the troops are to fight. It's actually rare in war for an army to raid, pillage, and annihilate a completely civilian target if they have no other options. And once again, historically, the ones that do that are either desperate or have no actual care for those they hurt and civilian casualties at all, and historically were looked upon as the villains in their respective conflicts. Even going to something like World War II. 
Pearl Harbor, military base, military target. And contrary to what the offensive Michael Bay movie showcased within it, the Japanese in that attack did not go after civilian targets, just the base. End of the war, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Both were also military targets, but the implementation of the first nuclear bomb drops and the resultant civilian casualties were a strong arm move to force surrender after a long conflict the Japanese imperial military refused to end, despite the reality that they'd already lost. Neo Zeon in the Unicorn story? They're not being callous with civilian casualties. They're trying to prevent more losses by focusing their attention solely on those responsible for all of this, thus were deemed acceptable. It's the ugly, but unavoidable side of war, lest more atrocities be allowed to take place. Really, Zitterman just wanted information from them himself. On the whereabouts of Marita as well, Zitterman's basically her surrogate dad, having rescued her from a Federation-approved brothel where she'd been enslaved since she was a preteen. And learning where she's been sent makes him want to just abandon the Dakar offensive, but he can't do so lest he be responsible for them failing. It's putting aside what he wants for what he believes to be in the best interests of everyone. And really, if Neo Zeon were a moral monsters, were fighting for the sake of conflict, why would they ever consider sparing their enemies, even after Hathaway and Bonjour admitted to being two of the enemy pilots? That doesn't make sense from the perspective that Zeon is inciting all of this. Because if the positions were reversed, the Federation can and has abused prisoners of war, as shown in the situation Marita herself, in this story, has found herself in where they are torturing her into compliance. This is not a showcase of both sides are bad hypocrisy nonsense, people. One side literally abuses people far more clearly and consistently to get their way. But the thing showcased most consistently by the UC timeline is those abused when finally given a chance to lash out and fight back. Yeah, they're not going to lash out at anyone, but aim it at those responsible, as is happening here. Lonnie, despite what she lost, doesn't hold against Hathaway or Bonager or any of the other military. They're just obstacles to her getting at the people who gave the order that murdered her family. And all that ties into the attack points and bonus events for this stage. Bonager and Hathaway having to fight Lonnie in her giant mobile armor, the Shamblo, and talk her down before, from the perspective, she takes things too far. As the Shamblo is a psycho frame equipped unit that unfortunately, is designed to be a weapon of mass destruction. In the anime adaptation, the psycho frame is faulty, driving Lonnie insane so she can't differentiate military and civilian targets, so in the Battle of Torrington, racks up a lot of casualties, until Bonager intervenes and calms her down, before the death of her replacement father figure, Kirks, renders her inconsolable, and the psycho frame runs rampant with her no longer controlling it, and Bonager having to risk his own life to stop her. I'll make you pay! This dark feeling that's inside you. Don't let it take over your heart. It won't do any good. Come back! Zion. Don't do this! Zion. Give it up already! Zion. 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 Our war is over. What are you waiting for? You're willing to die for possibility? Meaningless! Let it go! Isn't it sad? Fuck this scene. D fuck this scene! <sighs> While I listed a logical reason why Lonnie's family was trimmed down to just her, there is another reason that I just can't help myself in mentioning. See, several years ago, and unfortunately, when I went back to grab a screen cap literally when editing these reviews, the link had gone dead, I read an interview that said this changed the story, and the inclusion of Riddy in this scene at all, which he originally was not, came at the behest of Yoshiki Tomino. And the reason I bring it up despite it basically being hearsay without the evidence from that interview is, well, it fits an existing pattern with him that is not present with the novel's writer nor the anime's screenwriter in all the works I've seen from them. A lot of the works of Yoshiki Tomino, or ones he's in charge of or had a hand in making, 
can end up being overtly sexist with how they treat the women involved as nothing but as a cheap death, abuse victim, or as solely an accessory for another character, with the story then doing nothing else with them to try and justify narratively or thematically why what is done to them had to happen, as other stories, at the very least, made an attempt to provide, only giving that pathos to anyone else around them but them. Because, of course, we couldn't feel bad about the tragedies of war because anyone but a woman died or was brutalized, right? No, that's the beginning and end of it. Maybe someone else will briefly have a thing to do with it, but not in association to the character themselves. It's always cheap pathos for someone else, and not a natural end result of a character's actions in life as it is with stories overseen by anyone else. And if there might be more to them than that... Oh, the logic that follows from this? They have to be villains. And this is not an unknown condemnation of Tomino. While he is the first to hold the title of a kill em all writer, succeeded later by the likes of Toshiki Inoue and Gen Orobuchi, he has a vastly higher rate of killing women characters than the men in his series. And it isn't just that they died, it is in the way they died. A guy dies in a Tomino work, they often have some last stand or it's the natural end of a character arc. An arc antagonist dies as he's finally defeated by the protagonist, their plans thwarted, the hero standing triumphant. I don't see that in the reverse. Victory Gundam. Its women pilots on the protagonist's side were treated as disposable cannon fodder that died because they were completely incompetent. And the Sheen at the end of Zeta, for no reason, opens her cockpit only to get caught in an explosion that she knew was going to happen that is the actual cause of her death. She is a seasoned combatant and military officer. As her unit was fully operational, she had zero reason to open the hatch and walk out of it to literally cause her death. Cassilia Zabi, Char's last zombie member kill, doesn't even get to do anything at all in the series besides stand around, and her end just her being blindly shot in the head through glass that should be bulletproof because they're out in goddamn space. Tomino actually had direct kind of reason for why Char took her out that way in The Origin too, implying in those OVAs that she had a... thing. Her little boys when Char was a kid. <sighs> but are you getting my point with this without requiring me to list off every example from all of his works over the years? If you have a creator that seems to decide whether a woman cast member lives or dies by flipping a coin, and not as a part of their natural character arc or otherwise deliberately chooses to vilify them without sense or reason, well, congratulations. They're very likely writing their characters in a sexist manner. And this hasn't been disproven by the man's own statements. In an interview from when he was making the rounds about the G. Greco compilation movies, he said his primary issue with the AU Gundam series which have captains that happen to be women is because, direct quoting that, their breasts would get in the way of them doing their jobs. You seriously cannot convince me otherwise after that, especially since other creators for the Gundam franchise have a better track record on this. And that's not even the fucking end of it. And it's another reason why I get so annoyed at people promoting Tomino as being great at making shows that appeal to women outside of demographic expectations. He isn't. The people who were hired to actually write the shows under him were. And the demographic shift for the series that keeps being misplaying the merchandising that any series would otherwise have exactly coincides with the increase of sexist depictions in series he oversaw. It's really among the single most frustrating blame ships I've ever seen in regards to him constantly bashing the AU timeline series where the producers do try to appeal to wide audiences by default, but don't catch them due to the general perception and precedence that he is the root of causing. The other writers that wrote the original Gundam have a better track record than him. The writers of Zeta and Double Zeta that were under him have a better track record than him, as does both Unicorn's original writer Harutoshi Fukui, as this scene did not exist in the novels in this way that makes it so problematic, and the anime screenwriter Yasuki Muto. This is not my sole reason for hating this scene. I would have actually preferred it, if it had to be done, by Bandra being forced with no choice to put her out of her misery. To save her from the rampaging psycho frame and, like Lelouch does with Euphemia and Code Geass, show mercy through the last freedom someone can have, instead of her sanity slowly being eroded away, as atrocities are being committed around her. It is a cruel act, and yet a kind one when the full context is known. That way, it would represent a child having to make a hard decision where there are no good endings, and thus take a step into adulthood where the best solution is not so easily achieved from simple notions that war is bad, 
and be forced to recognize that, while there are an objective good and objective evil, the world is often a mess of grays where you may be forced into a situation where acts of evil are thou thine good. As originally written, it's another step along his path of placing himself firmly in the center of the conflicting sides, and actually listening and seeing the greater conflict for what it is to make his own decisions about Lapless. But because it's Riddy who steals the kill, it robs Bonnager of that lesson that informs his perspective of things, and also makes clear that Lonnie could have been saved, had been saved, had already been standing down as he stole the weapon. She was surrendering and intentionally redirected the shot aimed at them through her own will, as those reflector bits were psycho frame tech, so he didn't hurt them, as she couldn't stop it from firing. And killing a surrendering enemy in a war is a war crime. And it wasn't that way in Unicorn's originating novels, where Lonnie's still alive and main piloting the same mech father would just not stop no matter what. So it was up to Lonnie to disable the Shamblow's defenses to let Bonninger end their rampage. Hell, it's because she redirected those reflector bits that there even was a way to shoot the Shamblow in the first place. As if you paid attention to the earlier battle? Yeah, the Shamblow's defenses were deflecting all beam fire entirely. The only way the shot would have worked to kill her is if she left herself open as she was standing down. There is no other interpretation there if you're paying attention. And Riddy's entire speech refuting Boninger's wish to believe in something better, that didn't exist. That was Tomino. That was Tomino rebuking the possibility that things can be made better if the causes of the conflict are actually addressed. It is the act that breaks Riddy as a character in the OVAs as he shows a callous disregard for anything but himself and his own interests. And it's something never recognized for what it is, which once more informs the greater reading of Universal Century Gundam that the Federation is legitimately the problem, both for the atrocities they themselves commit and the ones they enable. Because Riddy is a member of this elite ruling class that are the problem. And you see directly from this how he treats other people. And again, this is all said to have been a change Tomino made to the story at his own discretion. In the interview I read, once again, I hate that I can't link to it, so I have to keep citing this as hearsay unless someone else can find it when I have failed, stated that of the changes made to the story when it went from novel to anime form, it was the change that writer Harutoshi Fukui outright hated. And even the anime's writer Yasuki Muto said he had his own reservations with it, because this entire altered scene just is that damaging to everything around it. And then there's how the dub made this worse due to its casting decisions. Because Lonnie is voiced in the dub by Karen Strassman. Thus, through the power of actor illusion, they had Suzaku Kururugi murder Callan Kozuki. I just... Callan, would you like to offer your own response? Let's end this once and for all! <laughs> Honestly, this wouldn't be so bad if Kogias' creators actually recognized how awful a person Suzaku was and didn't treat Kallen like shit after R1, despite her narratively being the deuteragonist of that story besides Lelouch. Literary analysis of Kogias kind of makes that show frustrating with how much parts after R1 actively fight themselves. But again, because this is a Super Robot Wars game, she does not have to die. Fight and defeat her with Bonninger and Hathaway, allowing her to express the sorrow of her story and let them empathize with her, and you can get her to stand down and turn away from the part of the city where she was deployed that would only create more victims like her. Also known as adverting Lonnie from becoming a character like Shin and avoid his screw-ups destiny was built around. Because you can reason with her. It does not address and allow the Federation officials to be held accountable and pay for their crimes, they do get off scot-free for another day, but at least there is acknowledgement that there are victims whose voices should be heard. Violence is the first weapon of the oppressor, and the last of the oppressed. But they are not the only ones here. After all, the one who leaked this operational Lando Bell was Amalgam, meaning Leonard's here as well. And yes, Kaname is with them, held hostage by him so she can see the reality of war, what he says he wants to change. 
but she's being obstinate as she legitimately hates him. So much that she's thrown off Sophia's influence for the moment, and notices Sosuke's absence as Leonard insists on deploying his agents to screw with things. Jihoud also deploying with Marita shoved into the Black Unicorn, the Banshee, whose psycho frame reacts with the Shamblos to drive them both crazy. And it's all ramping up falsified evidence for Leonard's thesis that this is somehow Kaname's fault. Which again, it's not. Nor is it Sophia's despite her meddling because this is the actual canonical tech level of the Universal Century at this point. To give Tessa some spotlight. Put simply, you are a piece of shit and there's nothing I hate more than when arrogant pricks like you try to talk like they're anything but selfish murderers. So fuck you and go to hell. And all seems hopeless, at least until Sosuke enters the battle on this egg-looking thing. Okay, backstory. Volume 8 of Full Model Panic had Sosuke enter an old model arms slave fighting ring in an attempt to get into an amalgam agent recruiting facility. The owner of the arms slave he was using, Nami, happened to be another whisperer, who grew attached to him as, well, all the women whispered have a thing for Sosuke due to Sophia's time transcendent attachment to Kaname. It did not end well for her. I have to surrender. I... Wait, you know what? I think I just changed my mind. Sidebar, Invisible Victory has a tie-in PS4 game. There is a timeline that exists where we can save Nami showcased within it. Said game also taps the final novels of Full Metal Panic, so for those interested in seeing the parts of the story that haven't gotten into anime form yet, there you go. It's written in the same visual novel style Super Robot Wars uses, but to my understanding most of it is a direct lift as the game script was written by Shinji Goto. Additional incentive to potentially play it? It has an alternative ending where you kick Leonard's ass with Bontakun. Anyways, because Sosuke's lived as a drill instructor, despite Amuro telling everyone they have no choice, and they have to kill all their enemies to make sure they can't hurt others, Sosuke refutes that. As they all know someone who can defeat everyone and anyone without actually having to kill them. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Kira Yamato path to the art of war. I'm not even kidding, an enemy loses their capability to fight if you disable every means of them to fight. So shred their weapon systems until there's nothing left and you don't have to kill them to defeat them. What's more back to what I said about Kira? His means of fighting was to overwhelm his enemies by such a margin that it demoralized them into fleeing as he gives them the free out to leave. Instead of making like a Grim Reaper where the fight or flight response of a human would automatically make them think fight was the only way to live. Instill the fear of God and show mercy, and any sane person would choose to flee. And this is something even Amuro is forced to acknowledge. Don't steal the lives of good people. Save them, and together you will redeem a broken world. Though that is assuming that you can, you know, get the Federation officials out of office without force, because you still need to do that to not trap them in the same repetitive goddamn cycle. And while Bonniger and Hathaway double-team saving Lonnie, you need to have deployed the Puru sisters in their Cubilees to fight the Black Unicorn to get Marita points to save her from the brainwash the Vist family put her under to revert her to just another Puru clone instead of the person she's evolved into. And also the NTD system trying to kill her. But on Sosuke's side, well, he's got to fight Gauron. And in an old model AS like this, he's not got a chance. 
So good of him that his friends also brought his new unit, the Leviathan, with I freshly restored from backup within it and it sporting a perfected Lambda Drive. And hell, the narrative bits here confirm Nami survived in this timeline as well. And since Mithril was still a solvent organization instead of remnants, they were able to get her out of the danger she ended up in, and she in turn helped out in the final development of their new arm slave, which Sosuke can now use to take Gauron down. <laughs> あれ with Hathaway being pulled away to once again argue with Lane, and knowing what I do about Hathaway's Flash, this is the most telling of what happens there. Lane is all about orders above everything, even compassion, not caring about the wrongs the government commits in the name of control. Hathaway constantly here talking about the dangers of blind faith and obedience in an institution, ultimately leading to the betraying of his people. But then it gets stupid with it trying to once more have Hathaway fucking retcon who and what quest was in Shard's counterattack, saying she was trying to achieve a world without war. To paraphrase an official character profile about quests, Quest is a selfish, stubborn, sociopathic, manipulative, and love obsessed girl. When she wants to have something, she'll demand it, believing it is rightfully hers. She does not listen to others, and people around her tend to only tolerate or excuse her conduct due to the fact she is a developing teen. Literally no one who paid attention to Shar's counterattack is buying this. Hathaway is talking out of his ass. Yes, I know that was supposedly in the novelization, but the novelization is not the canon interpretation of the character. Hathaway's Flash, both the original book and film, tried to take this interpretation, but as with a lot of Tomino's works trying to half-ass a fix, he doesn't really grasp what the problem was. Still, by facing the Banshee with the Kubelays, we can get Morita's current brainwashed state revealed to the greater cast and get her to retreat. Lane and Lane also withdrawing, allowing Sosuke to catch a signal from the communicator Kaname managed to steal. Without Sophie influencing her mind, she's been able to think straight enough to acknowledge Leonard's bullshit as just that, manipulative lies. But he tries to regain control of the situation, saying that it is her wilting heart that's betraying her to repeat a cycle carved into the world. Once again, wrong cycle, wrong people responsible. So what he decides to do to prove his point on the frailty of her hearts is hand her a gun. Because, of course, she would never actually shoot him. Let's go. Just wait a second. You've lost. Give that here. No, get away from me! <laughs> yeah, Leonard did not think this through. Once again, the wavering of her true self is a result of her sense of self being subsumed by Sophia. So her waffling on whether to shoot, to actually collaborate with Leonard to fix what she broke, her shooting is an act of defiance in her deepest soul, that's resisting what Sophia is doing to her. And as the Federation forces suddenly come to flood the area, Sophia tries to take over again to get Kaname to push Sosuke away. But you know what? Screw that! I've changed my mind. Forget what I just said! I don't care if I hurt someone! <laughs> you come and get me! Find me and take me home! Rescue me no matter what it takes! Put all of those stupid, annoying, nonsense soldier skills of yours to use, okay? No matter who you're up against, you beat them up and come hold me tight! Not a problem. <laughs> Don't you worry. I'll find you. Sosuke, I love you. I love you, Chittery. I'll be waiting. To be continued in a fifth and final season that might never get made, alongside the light novels where... Who knows if we'll ever get those? They dropped distribution of them years ago. Eh, at least we have the video game adaptation of the final novels. Next time, we wrap up this side of the route split and move on to the AD dimension.
My Gain falters in battle against the forces of Exev, as his Ange and Hilda are given the opportunity to return to their nations and lost loved ones. An invasion of war finally has Shin come to his own, while a conference is finally held with the leaders of the dragons. And watching it all, a bored creator begins an overture to court his prospective bride. Next time on Super Robot Wars V, Over the Rainbow, you can't go home again.